Good morning. If you will make your way in, if everyone would stand, we'll get started this morning. Who am I that the highest king would welcome me? I was lost, but he brought me in, oh, his love for me. Oh, his love for me. Who the sun sets free. Oh, is free indeed. I'm a child of God. Yes, I am. In my Father's house, there's a place for child of God, yes I am. Free at last he has ransomed me, his grace runs deep. While I was a slave to sin, Jesus died for me. Yes, he things that I need to make to make you they say I'm not on am I on do you hear me now we got a couple of things that I need to bring to your uh, attention one that last week we failed to remember to tell to the church that Bailey Taylor was baptized at Camp Deer Run. That's been two weeks ago, but anyway, we just wanted to tell you about that. 
And we have a note to Lamar Avenue Church of Christ from, the, from Miss Naomi Bassett's family. It said, Mom or Grandma loved this church. Her memorial service was perfect. Thank you for each person who attended. The flowers were beautiful and the meal was greatly appreciated. Even, even more meaningful to us was the love and care shown to her by this church, especially in recent years. She loved the visits and the cards. She loved each of you. Thank you. If you will bow with me, we will pray. And Father, we thank you again today for all the things that you bless us with and father for the for the beauty of this day and father we're so thankful to have the opportunity to be here and have the opportunity to worship you father i just ask that you be with us as we go on and continue in our service father and i ask that you be with us that you lift us up and we always put you first in our lives for all these things we pray in jesus name amen Let's stand as we continue to worship together. Once I was lost, wandering in darkness, no life inside, no hope inside. He called my name and healed my blindness. Set me ablaze, now I'm alive with His love breaking through my heart of stone, love breathing to awake my bones, love reaching out to save my soul, love never gonna let me go. And now my heart, so full of worship, I can't hold back. I can't contain it for all he's done. Jesus, my Savior, I am a place and full of thanks for his love breaking through my heart of stone, love breathing to awake my bones, love reaching out to save my soul, love never gonna let me go. Love calling me as I am, love making me new again, love lifting me when I can, love never gonna let me go. Wherever you've been, wherever you've been, whatever you've done, whatever you've done, come as you are, come into his open arms. Wherever you've been. you are. Come find his love breaking through my heart of stone, love breathing to awake my bones, love reaching out to save my soul, love never gonna let me go, love calling me as I am, love making me new again, love lifting me when I can't, love never gonna let me go. Love breaking through my heart of stone, love breathing to awake my bones, love reaching out to save my soul, love never gonna let me go, love calling me as I am, love making me new again, love lifting me when I can't, love never gonna let me go, love never gonna let me go. Love never gonna let me go. I accidentally skipped too many pages when I was flipping through here, so thanks for staying on track without me. <coughs> I love you, Lord. Oh, your mercy never fails me. All my days I've been held in your moment that I wake up until I lay my head, I will sing of the goodness of God all my life. All my life you 
have been faithful all my life. All my life you have been so, so good with it. Every breath that I am able, I will sing of the goodness. In case you didn't know, yesterday was my wife Charity's birthday, um, <clears throat> so th this doesn't apply to her, but it applies to me. I'm getting to the age now where my children are in their teens and, and early adulthood. Um, she's not, again, she's 29 again, so it uh, doesn't apply to her. But the other day, uh, she was telling me on, we have Life360 app on our phones where we can see where all the family is at. And she said, you know, five years ago when I opened up Live 360, it zoomed into Paris and everyone was here. And, and now, five years later, I open it up and it zooms up to two, two or three different states because, you know, we have one kid that may be in Arkansas and one's in Houston on a mission trip. And it almost gives you some anxiety when that opens up and everyone's kind of spread out because they're still your children, even though they're, they're kind of far away from you. And that got me thinking about um, Jared's lesson last week about the parables of the lost sheep, the lost coin, and the lost son. And I got to looking at some words that stood out to me uh, in the parable of the lost sheep. The shepherd said, rejoice for me, for I have found my lost sheep. And in the lost coin, the woman said, rejoice for me, for I have found my lost coin. And then the father said, this son of mine was dead, but is alive again. So even though the coin, the sheep, and the son, they were lost, uh, it didn't negate the fact that they belonged to someone. Um, even while they were lost, they, they still belonged. So just like the sheep, the coin, and the son, we belong to him. We belong to the Father. Uh, even though sometimes we might be far away, whether that's physically far away, in a relationship far away, or spiritually far away, we, you and I, we still belong to the Father. So what I'm saying is the distance doesn't really equal disownment. We're still his. I think that scripture echoes that. 2 Corinthians 1, uh, 21 through 22 says, Now it is God who makes both us and you stand firm in Christ. He anointed us 
He set his seal of ownership on us and put his spirit in our hearts as a deposit, guaranteeing what is to come. And in uh, the old hymn, Victory in Jesus, uh, it also says he's, he sought me and he bought me. So we belong to him, and that's great news. But uh, we have to realize that there was a price that was paid so that we're not lost forever. And that price is, is in the bread and in the cup. So if you'll bow with me. Heavenly Father, God, we are thankful for the opportunity to be here together today and participate uh, in unity in this ceremonial meal of, of remembrance. Uh, as we take this bread, Lord, and we take this cup, I pray that we're reminded that it represents the body of Christ that was broken and the blood of Christ that was spilled as an atonement for our sin and a sacrifice that guarantees that like the sheep and the coin and the son, we're not lost forever. We do these things, uh, God, in remembrance of your son, Jesus, and it's in his name that we pray. Amen. I am mine no
God is good, amen? God is good, amen? If you guys can't tell, uh, I think I might have spent a little, much, little too much time around Jared uh, this summer. Um, but seriously, uh, thank you guys. Uh, thank you, Jared. Thank you, Chris, for giving me the opportunity to be up here this morning and to share uh, with you guys some of the, the things that I've been studying through this summer. Uh, as you guys know, we are working through the parables right now. And the parable we're going to be looking at today is titled, The Rich Fool. And it can be found in Luke chapter 12, in verses 13 through 21. So if you want to go ahead and be turning there in your Bibles, we'll be over there in just a second. Again, that's Luke 12, 13 through 21. But before we dive deeper into this one specific parable, I think it's important that we take a look at parables from a broader context as a whole. Okay, I know every uh, sermon we hear on parables, they usually open up with a brief introduction of parables, and sometimes it can get kind of monotonous, but I think it's important for us to be reminded of kind of the overall aspect of parables themselves. So I wanna, what I want to draw your attention to this morning is that I believe when Jesus told these stories, when he told these parables, I believe that he had intended meanings behind them for us to grasp as Christians. Now when I say this, I'm not necessarily saying that he had one intended meaning for every parable. Okay, as you guys know, we don't always agree or interpret parables exactly the same, but rather I think there are directions, there was intention behind Jesus' teaching, and there are intended meanings for us to find. Klein Snodgrass writes a book, it's about this thick, uh, me and Jared like to pretend to read it sometimes, um, but it's entitled, uh, short, or it's entitled Stories with Intent, and he looks at every parable within the New Testament. And I think that's the perfect uh, title for a book on the parables of Jesus. I think Jesus was telling these stories and he had intent behind them. I don't think they were stories, open-ended stories that are just left for us to interpret in whichever way we see fit. So I th this morning I want to help us interpret this parable in a responsible way in which we get the intended meaning of Christ. And I think in doing this, it starts at con with context. Context is so important, not just when looking at parables, but within scripture as a whole. Okay, and I want to give you kind of an extreme case of how dangerous it can be to take Scripture out of context. So if I read to you this morning from 1 Corinthians 7, 8, it says, Now to the unmarried and the widows, I say it is good for them to stay unmarried as I do. Now if I read this verse like I just did, completely isolated and separated from the verses before it and the verses after it, completely separated from 1 Corinthians, from the New Testament, from Scripture as a whole, I can make a pretty compelling argument that Paul is saying that as Christians, we should not marry, okay? But we know that that's not the case because we have the context and we know that marriage is a good thing. But I bring your attention to this to show you that when we take scriptures and we isolate it away from its context, we can then easily twist scripture and take it away from its intended meaning and start to make it say what we want it to say. So today we're gonna to spend a lot of time looking at the context behind this parable. As most of you know, I'm a student at Oklahoma Christian University, and this last semester I took a class titled The Parables of Jesus, and come to find out that has come in handy this summer as I've been looking through some of the parables 
Um, but my professor's name was Dr. John Harrison, and he loves the parables of Jesus, and he's very wise, and he has a lot of years of experience interpreting them and teaching them. And he has a method that he taught us on how he interprets parables, and I've come to fall in love with that method, and that's how I look at parables now. So here's his method. He looks at the context of the parable, but he looks at three different kinds of context. He looks at the historical context of the parable, he looks at the gospel context of the parable, and he looks at it within the context of Jesus' ministry. And that's what we're going to do today. We're going to look at the historical context. We're going to see how would the first century audience viewed some of the things and some of the aspects of this parable. What would they have thought when they heard this? How would it fit into their society? How would it have fit into their culture? Then we're going to look at it in its gospel context. In this case, the gospel that we find this parable within is the gospel of Luke. Okay, so we're going to look at Luke and kind of how Luke teaches, how Luke writes, and some of the methods that he uses to teach in, throughout his writings. Okay, And then we're going to look at it within the context of Jesus' ministry. How does this parable line up with other teachings of Jesus? If we interpret a parable and we find that it contradicts Jesus' teachings even slightly, we have interpreted that parable wrong because no parable is going to contradict the teachings of Jesus. So once we go through this and look at these different contexts, I think we will have enough information, enough knowledge to responsibly interpret and apply this parable into our 21st century lives. But before we dive deeper into that, I want to read you a quote from Amy Jill Levine in her book uh, titled Short Stories of Jesus. She says, religion has been defined as designed to comfort the afflicted and to afflict the comfortable. I'll read that again. Religion has been defined as designed to comfort the afflicted and to afflict the comfortable. We do well to think of, parables, of the parables of Jesus as doing the afflicting. Therefore, if we hear a parable and think, I really like that, or worse, fail to take any challenge, we are not listening well enough. In other words, when we read parables, or any scripture for that matter, and we just hear it, and we understand it, and we think, well, that's a good story. I like what he's getting at here. We are not truly learning, okay? We need to open our hearts, and we need to let our hearts be challenged. So I want to encourage you today as we dive into Scripture, as we dive into the parables and the teachings of Jesus, to not just hear these words, but to let your hearts be opened and to be challenged by them. So let's go ahead and look at the text that we're going to be using today. Again, it's Luke 12, 13 through 21, and I'll go ahead and just read the whole thing. So someone in the crowd said to him, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. Jesus replied, Man, who appointed me a judge or an arbiter between you? Then he said to them, Watch out. Be on guard against all kinds of greed. Life does not consist in an abundance of possessions. And he told them this parable. The ground of a, cer the ground of a certain rich man yielded an abundant harvest. He thought to himself, What shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. And uh, I have no place to store my crops, and there I will store my surplus of grain. Uh, and I'll say to myself, you have plenty of grain laid up for many years. Take life easy, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, you fool, this very night your life will be demanded from you. Then who will get what you have prepared yourself? This is how it will be with whoever stores up things for themselves towards God. So the first thing we're going to look at is the historical context. How would the first century audience have interpreted some of the things in this parable. The first thing we see in this scripture, in verse 13, we see this brother coming to Jesus asking for his inheritance. What is this inheritance? How does it fit in with the context of the first century audience? What does the Jewish law say about this inheritance? And in order to understand this, we need to go to Deuteronomy 21, 15 through 17. Okay, you can turn there if you want, but I'll go ahead and read it right here. Deuteronomy 21, 15 through 17, it says, if a man has two wives and he loves one but not the other, and both bear him sons, but the firstborn is the son of the wife he does not love, when he wills his property to his sons, he must not give the rights of the firstborn to the son of the wife he loves in preference to his actual firstborn. The son of the wife he does not love. He must acknowledge the son of his unloved wife as the firstborn by giving him a double share of all that he has. That son is the first sign of the father's strength. The right of the firstborn belongs to him. So we see, according to the Jewish law, that the older brother was to receive a double portion. Or he was to receive two-thirds, while the younger brother is to receive one-thirds. Now, in this parable, it seems to be the younger brother that's coming to Jesus, and he's coming to him out of one or two reasons. Either he has not received any of his inheritance, or he is wanting more than what the law requires. But whether or not it's one or the other does not really matter, because in verse 15, Jesus points out this man's true concern. 
In verse 15, actually I'll start in verse 14, it says, Jesus replied, Man who appointed me a judge or an arbiter between you. Then he said to them, Watch out, be on guard against all kinds of greed. Life does not consist in an abundance of possessions. Jesus points out this man's true concern. He shows that he's not concerned with following the law. He's not concerned with, with getting his inheritance so that he can be right by the law. But rather, he has a heart of covetousness. Okay, The definition of covetousness is greed or an excessive desire for gain. Greed within the Jewish society was considered to be kind of the root of a lot of evil. Okay, From greed stems a whole lot of other sins. Without greed, there is no adultery. Without greed, there is no coveting. Without greed, there is no stealing. Without greed, you fill in the blank. Okay, And Jesus points out that that was this man's true concern, that he had a heart full of greed. Then I want to draw your attention to verse 20. Verse 20 says, But God said to him, You fool, this very night your life will be demanded from you. Then who will get what you have prepared for yourself? We see this word demand. Okay? The Greek word that's used here for demand is the same word that was also commonly used when referring to collecting a loan. Okay? And so that word being used here could be insinuating the fact that everything we have on, in this life is on loan to us from God. In the case of the rich fool, his harvest, his crops, his barns, everything he had in this life was merely just on loan to him from God. You've heard the saying, you can't take it with you. That's essentially what this word could be implying. Okay, everything we have in this life stems from God, and without God, we are nothing. He can take everything from us in an instant, just like that. So that is kind of some historical context, some historical background. Now let's look at it within the context of the Gospel of Luke itself. In verses 17 through 19, we see what we call an interior monologue. Okay, Luke lets us in to the mind of this rich fool, and Luke does this a lot throughout his Gospel. Okay. And when he does this, he is usually kind of pointing us towards the bad guy, okay? Whoever he's letting us into their thoughts, if he's letting us into someone's thoughts, he's kind of telling us this person is bad, okay? And some examples of this, we see him letting us into the mind of a Pharisee, kind of showing where his heart at. The reference for that is Luke 7.39. And then we see the par- in the parable of the unjust judge, he lets us inside the mind of the judge as well. And that can be found in 18, 4 through 5. And I'm going to go ahead and read uh, this section, verses 17 through 19, so you can see what I'm talking about. Starting in verse 17, it says, He thought to himself, What shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. And he said to him, Then he said, This is what I'll do. I will tear down my barns and build bigger ones, and there I will store my surplus of grain. And I'll say to myself, You have plenty of grain laid up for many years. Take life easy, eat, drink, and be merry. I think Luke uses these interior monologues to show us that the sinfulness is not necessarily always in the outward act, okay? The fault is not necessarily in the act, but the fault is within the heart's intent. Outward, outwardly, it is not necessarily a bad thing for this rich fool to want to build bigger barns, okay? Wealth, having things, having more things, is not necessarily a bad thing. But Luke shows us by bringing us into his minds that his fault is not in his action, but his fault is within the intent of his heart, Another thing we see in Luke's Gospel, and within Acts as well, actually within Luke and Acts, in almost every chapter there is some reference to money or material possessions in some way. So Luke is clearly concerned with how our attitude towards the things that we have in this life should be. He's clearly concerned with teaching us that discipleship in the kingdom of Jesus requires us to rethink the way that we go about using the things that God has blessed us with in this life. So that's kind of some, some, some of the gospel context uh, in regards to Luke. Then we look at it within the context of Jesus' ministry. And it fits perfectly right in with the teachings of Jesus against the love of money and possessions. In Matthew 6, 19-24, we see this idea that we are not to lay up for ourselves treasures on this earth, but to lay up for ourselves treasures in heaven, where they will not perish and will they, where they will not be destroyed. Uh, We see the idea in Mark 10, 25, that it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of heaven. Jesus is clearly concerned with how we view and how we use our material wealth. Another thing I want to draw your attention to is the man, the rich fool, in this parable, he's considered a fool because he's pretty much a complete antithesis to the ministry of Jesus. Jesus' thesis statement 
essentially is that we must deny ourselves, that we must take up our cross and follow Him daily. That whoever tries to save his life will lose it, but whoever gives up his life for his sake will find it. Okay, And the man in this parable is clinging to his mortal life. He's clinging to the things he has in this life. And he's finding hope and trying to find joy and contentment and peace in these things rather than giving them up and following Christ. So he is a complete antithesis to the ministry of Jesus. So that is some background information on this parable, some overall context. So now that we have the context of this parable, let's start to apply it into our 21st century lives. Dr. Neil Lightfoot writes a book entitled Lessons from the Parables, and within this book, he gives five reasons as to why this man is considered a fool. And each of these reasons has to do with something that this man forgot. Okay, and before we dive into what these five things are, I want to go ahead and tell you that I think for us to responsibly interpret and apply this parable into our lives, we need to remember the things that this fool forgot. Okay, so as we go through these, I just want you to be aware of that. First thing he forgot, he forgot other people. Second thing, he forgot a man is more than what he owns. Third, he forgot the source of real joy. He forgot God, and he forgot death. So now let's go ahead and look at each of these a little closer. Firstly, he forgot other people. Within the interior monologue that we looked at earlier, when Luke lets us into his thoughts, within these three verses, this man uses 11 personal pronouns. There's a whole lot of me, I, mine, stuff like that. And he doesn't give a single thought to anyone else. Okay, He has all these things, and I'm sure that he had many laborers and workers who helped him and who harvested his crops and who put them in the storage bins. I'm sure he wasn't doing it all on his own, but he never gives a single thought to them. Not only that, but he never even gives a single thought to his neighbor. Okay, While he's sitting here with his feet kicked up, looking at all the things that he has and how comfortable he is in this life, his neighbor might be wondering where his next meal is coming from. But yet this man is sitting here, forgets other people, and is only concerned with himself. The next thing he forgot is that a man is more than what he owns. He did not distinguish between what a man has and what a man is. What we have in this life does not determine our standing with God. There's not a price tag on heaven. We don't have to have a certain amount of things before we can have a hope of having an eternal life with God. He did not realize that his identity should not be found in his possessions, but rather his identity should be found in God, the one who created him. Okay, He forgot where his identity was. He forgot that we are children of God through Christ. The next thing he forgot is he forgot the source of of real joy. You know as well as I do that indulging ourselves within the things of this world never leaves us satisfied. In fact, it always leaves us yearning and striving for more. Okay, we see in Ecclesiastes 2, 3 through 11, we see this man who has had everything. He's had everything, but at the end of showing us everything that he has had, he claims that everything is meaningless. It's like the wind. It's here for a moment, and then it's gone. That everything is meaningless. But God... What this man forgot is that God is the real source of joy. God gives us a joy through the hope that we have in His Son that is constant. It is always there. We can have this joy even when we're going through sufferings, even when we're going through trials. And this man forgot that. He tried to find joy in the things of this world. The next thing he forgot is he forgot God. Like we said earlier, the act of wanting to build bigger barns was not inherently a bad thing, but rather the fault was in his heart's intent. And not once, when he thinks about building these bigger barns, not once does he give thought to God. Not once does he think, how can I use the things that God has given me to glorify Him, to build and grow His kingdom? Not once does he give a thought to God. I want to draw your attention to James, 14, or James 4, 13 through 15. Okay? James 4, 13 through 15. It says, now listen, you who say today or tomorrow we will go to this city, spend a year there, carry on business, and make money. Why, why? You do not even know what will happen tomorrow. What is your life? You are a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if it is the Lord's will, we will, we will live and do this or that. I think a common shortcoming is, uh, of us as believers, and we also see within this man, is that a lot of times when we do things within our lives, we forget God. We make plans to do all these things, but we don't give thought to how can I do this, how can I plan my life in a way that it brings glory to God. Okay, and we see in the scripture 
Uh, he says, how can we even know that we will have a tomorrow? So shouldn't we be more concerned with him? And that brings us to the next thing he forgot. He forgot death. How can we be sure there is a tomorrow? Everything we have in this life can be taken away in an instant. As we saw in that word earlier, demand, everything on this, in this life that we know is just merely on loan to us from God. When these things are taken from us, these things that are on loan, when they're taken from us, it comes down to where our identity lies. Is our identity over here with the perishable, or is our identity in the eternal? I'll tell you right now, church, if our identity is in the perishable, we will perish with them. But if our identity is over here with the eternal one, the God who created us, we will live in eternity with Him. So what is the overall lesson of this parable? Klein Snodgrass sums it up really well in one sentence. Okay, he says, The fault is not in the possession themselves, but how tightly we cling to them or the use we make of them. I'll read that again. The fault is not in the possessions themselves, but how tightly we cling to them or we make use of them. As Christians, we need to be careful about how we use the things we have in this life. We cannot let them determine who we are. Okay, we are called, as Luke shows us and tries to drive the point home, that we are called as disciples of Christ to view the things we have in this life differently than how the world views them. Our priorities should be on the one who created us, not the things that he created. Our priorities should be on the creator, not creation. We shouldn't be so consumed with greed like the brother was at the beginning of this story, but rather our focus and our worry should be on the state of our relationship with God. As Christians, I think we need to constantly be evaluating or reevaluating our lives and seeing where our intentions lie. What are our intentions with the things that God has given us? <clears throat> if when we evaluate our lives, if greed is found in any way, whether it's with material wealth or any other thing, I encourage you today to seek help from God, to seek strength from His Spirit, and to cut that off at the root. Because we saw earlier that greed is the root of a whole lot of evil, a whole lot of different sins. So we need to cut it off at the root. And when we do that, when we seek help and guidance from the Spirit of God in doing so, we need to take the energy that we were placing towards that greed, and we need to take that energy and place it towards the effort that we are putting into our relationship with God. So in order for us to use what God has given us for His glory, we cannot forget, as the rich fool did, but rather we must remember. We cannot forget others. We need to help others when we can. We need to be thinking constantly about how we can help encourage and help support those who are around us. We cannot forget them. We have to remember others. We cannot forget that we are more than what we own. Our identity is not in the things that we have in this world, but our identity is in God, okay, and is in Christ. We cannot forget, but we must remember that we are children of God through Christ. We cannot forget the true source of joy, okay? We will never find contentment. We will never find happiness. We will never find joy in the things that we have in this life. Okay, but we must remember that true joy, true contentment comes from placing our faith and having a hope in Christ and what He has done for us. It's a joy that we can have no matter what the circumstance is. We can always find joy and we can always find hope in Christ. So we cannot forget that, but rather we must remember. We cannot forget God. We cannot leave God behind when we are planning things within our life. Okay? We cannot leave Him in the background, but we need to bring Him to the forefront of every decision that we make. We need to remember Him okay, in order that we use things, use the things that He has given us to glorify Him. We have to remember God. We cannot forget death. How do we even know there is a tomorrow? We need to live like there is no tomorrow. Okay? If we knew that the world was going to end tomorrow, that Jesus was coming back, I don't think we'd be concerned with I don't think we'd go on a spending spree, okay? I think we'd be more concerned with getting right with God if we aren't already. So if we remember these things as we go throughout our lives rather than forget them as the rich fool did, I think that we can use and responsibly interpret and apply this parable, this parable into our 21st century lives. 
I want to leave you today uh, with a scripture in Matthew 6, 19 through 24. So if you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn there. Matthew 6, 19 through 24. And I'm going to skip some of the verses in the middle of it. But starting in verse 19, it says, Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moths and vermin destroy, and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where moths and vermin do not destroy, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And then I'm going to skip down to verse 24. No one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted to the one and you will despise the other. You cannot serve God and be enslaved to money. We cannot serve the desires of our flesh. We cannot serve the things of this world and be enslaved to God. We cannot fully submit to God's will if we are completely consumed with the things of this world. So we, as Christians, are faced with a decision to make. Who are we going to serve? I encourage you today to serve the Eternal One, the One who never fails, whose love is unwavering. The things of this world will fade away, okay? They are merely on loan to us from God. And one day, He's going to collect those things. But what is not on loan to us from God is God's love. God's love is not on loan to us. It will never fade away. It is a solid rock upon which we can always find hope in which we can always find true joy and contentment. Romans 8.38 says nothing can separate us from the love of Christ. No matter how bad we fall short, no matter how far we stray away from God, God loves us and nothing can change that. He is always waiting for us to come back to Him. So today I want to encourage you as followers of Christ to make a conscious effort to make the relationship, your relationship with God, your top priority. And to rethink and reevaluate the way that you use the things that He has blessed you with so that you can use them in a way that we glorify Him. We cannot forget as the rich fool did, but rather we must remember. If you're ready to make that decision today, if if you're ready to rethink the way that you use the things that God has given you, you want to use the things you have to glorify Him, or if you have any need, please come as we stand and we sing. My worth is not in what I own, not in the strength of flesh and bone, but in the costly wounds of love at the cross. My worth is not in skill or name, in win or lose, in pride or shame. But in the blood of Christ that flowed at the cross, I rejoice in my Redeemer, greatest treasure, wellspring of my soul. I will trust in Oh, this satisfies.
together as as a people um, I pray that you would help us always to remember that our trust is in you that our wealth is in you that our uh, future is in you and not in material possessions not in money not in um, politics not in anything else other than you I pray that you would uh, help us to uh, remember that as we go out this week uh, to remember you uh, and it's in the name of Jesus Christ I pray. Amen.